My name is John Plisky. Uh, I'm from Groupon. I'm uh, the lead on the performance engineering team. I'm going to talk about uh, asynchronous personalization and CDNs and A-B testing and stuff like that. Um, you may know me. I was actually on TechCrunch a little while ago. Um, this photo was leaked. Uh, so th <laughs> there's, there's my face. Um, you can also find me on Twitter or via the emails. Uh, so basically, you're going to go over some background about why you might care about any of this, uh, talk about CDN caching, uh, asynchronous personalization, and a little multivariate testing. Um, this might not reflect what's in the program, so feel free to leave at any time. But um, So Groupon, as you, if you've heard of them, um, they're growing incredibly fast. So we have a big Rails app. We have a big team. Um, we have big traffic. So this uh, equals performance issues, some development process hurdles, and uh, drinking problems. Uh, so we're, we've reached the limit of Rails caching. Uh, to some extent. Uh, Low-level optimizations, um, like infrastructure work, uh, or just like, you know, C-level stuff um, is a little bit too incremental at times. SQL is boring, and uh, we also kind of want to be able to improve the uh, pl platform architecture on a whole. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to see kind of how we have done that. Um, so to give you a little background, uh, about on January 1st or so, we uh, basically find out that we're going to have some Super Bowl commercials. But don't worry, it's not going to be a big deal. They're before and after the game. So uh, two weeks later, OK, so we got an in-game spot. Uh, are we still cool? Uh, sure, yeah. And then uh, Super Bowl, uh, that's when we offend a bunch of people. And, uh, but luckily, we did our part, and uh, nothing, nothing happened. So if you didn't catch our Super Bowl commercials, um, don't bother, because it might upset you. Um, <laughs> so uh, for the Super Bowl, we, we, did, we had to make some drastic changes, because we had such a short timeline. Uh, we basically uh, implemented what we called spike mode. Um, that includes the air quotes. Uh, and the idea was we CDN cache everything. So everything is, is in the, uh, the content distribution network. And um, that means we had to disable login to the site, which um, makes people unhappy. Uh, we also offloaded geocoding, subscriptions, and orders to EC2. Um, this limited functionality, though, meant that people couldn't print their Groupons, uh, basically do a lot of things that they really, really enjoy doing. So uh, that made them unhappy. So we basically uh, wanted to figure out a way to do that differently. Um, here's a picture of our dashboard during the Super Bowl. You can see these neat spikes and stuff. Um, Here's another interesting graph that shows just how powerful a CDN can be. During the uh, Super Bowl, our uh, response time went down significantly because the uh, requests aren't hitting the app anymore. They're just going straight to the CDN. So it's really kind of interesting to compare these spikes, which reflect the traffic, and then our response time just kind of plummets when we turn that on. So we basically are looking for a way to get those benefits while not making users sad. Um, so a little bit about CDNs. Uh, if you're not familiar, they are uh, basically a network of servers that cache content uh, from your application or site and uh, put them near the users. So uh, they've got pros and cons. Pros, low latency. Uh, you get to use words like edge side nodes, which is awesome. Um, high capacity. Uh, and they're great for static content, where you, know, you just send it to the CDN and uh, it just goes to town. Um, cons, dynamic content is not uh, trivial to uh, serve from a CDN. Um, personalization, it also adds a significant amount of complexity. So for a lot of cases, it's, uh, it's overkill. Um, some of the specific issues that, that we ran into are uh, personalized content, like our login menu and the personalized deals for users, uh, analytics tracking, A-B testing, and uh, just Rails development practices kind of and how that interacts with uh, this new kind of approach that we're using for uh, the personalization. So um, to solve these, these issues, we are using what's called, what we're calling uh, asynchronous personalization. 
Um, there's a great talk from Chris Williams uh, from uh, Gotham Ruby Conference 2010 called uh, Rails Best Caching Method is JavaScript. And uh, we've taken a lot from that. And so the idea is essentially, um, well, his, his talk was not about CDNs, but uh, the idea that you can use JavaScript as a caching layer uh, instead of or in addition to the built-in Rails uh, cache stuff. So uh, the idea is we cache the anonymous page into, in the CDNs, the same page that you would see if you just go to the group on site, uh, no logins, no subscriber cookies, nothing. Uh, we cache that in the CDN, so that comes back immediately. Um, then we hide stuff. Uh, we make an AJAX request for personalized data and content, and uh, then we show stuff. So it's very, very simple. <laughs> um, here's uh, the obligatory uh, OmniGraffle diagram. Um, as you can see, we hit the, uh, the web browser hits the CDN. That takes you know 50 milliseconds. Uh, we then make the long trip down to the Rails stack uh, for a single request. And uh, there's also, in this case, we're using a tracking pixel that only hits uh, Nginx. So uh, the benefit here is that there's a, a limited, uh, you only touch the Rails stack for a limited number of requests, uh, which is, is great. So here's kind of what we're doing right now. This is our division page, so Los, Los Angeles, uh, in this case, um, the featured deal can change depending on your user. So we have to hide all of these elements that you can see, um, the header menu and the side deals. Uh, on the deal page, which gets a lot of traffic, for, uh, for example, from emails, users directly clicking a, a link in their email, uh, it's a slightly less invasive experience. Um, since the deal page has the deal on it, we don't have to hide that. That's already there. We just uh, load the side deals and the, the menu asynchronously. Um, so the experience to the user is they, you know, within 50 milliseconds, see the deal. And by the time they you know, have decided to look at the side deals, that is populated. So that's, that's a great experience. Um, some numbers for you. These are very rough and uh, border on fake. Uh, <laughs> they're just from a browser. but. Um, before, for anonymous use, the anonymous use case, uh, the initial page response time is around 0.8 seconds. Uh, rendering time around one second. Do some math. I'm guessing that's around 1.8 seconds. Uh, after the uh, asynchronous personalization, it's about a 0.1 second initial response time, one second rendering, so about 1.1 seconds. So that's only a little bit faster, but it is great for capacity because almost n none, of the, uh, none of these requests actually hit the server because the anonymous page just gets displayed right away. Uh, there's no backend API call. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, for logged in users or people with subscriber cookies or fancy uh, refer params and, and such, uh, it's about a three second response time initially. Um, one second rendering, four seconds. Uh, after the implementation, 0.1 seconds, one second rendering time, 1.1 seconds. Uh, in this case, the capacity is, is pretty much constant because we are making that backend request still, so the number of requests stays about the same, uh, but it's about 300% faster, which is, which is great. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of the development implications uh, that we've run into um, are pretty interesting. So. Basically, what's happening is there's less Rails. Uh, you guys probably thought you were at RailsConf or something for a second, uh, and more JavaScript. So, since one user does not necessarily equal one request in the background or in the in the back end, uh, things like current user, session, cookies, all standard parts of a, a Rails development, um, you know, in the view and the controller layer, are basically useless in certain cases because when a request hits the CDN, well, when a request hits a CDN for the first time, it's going to make the request to the back end. So if you don't uh, strip away current user session and cookies, that user's session and cookies are going to essentially be cached in the CDN. So you basically have to ignore those on CDN requests. Um, 
There's also some significant issues we ran into with testing. Uh, we personally use um, Cucumber and uh, RSpec, but if you write your tests with the standard, you know, current user session, et cetera, um, that's not necessarily going to work. And you're going to have to start using JavaScript in your tests when you might not have before. Um, if, for example, you need to test that certain parameters get converted to cookies, uh, that all used to happen in the controller layer. Um, now if you run that test and this is on, they're all going to fail because no cookies get set. Um, and that's actually what I've been dealing with lately, and it's, uh, it's interesting, to say the least. Um, so what we're doing uh, in JavaScript uh, to kind of make things easier for our developers um, is we've added some uh, event-driven hooks that allow you to access, uh, in our case, Groupon.CurrentUser, which is populated with uh, user information. Um, so you can wrap your code uh, in this callback, and it'll get executed after this AJAX request is made. Um, so, uh, for example, if we had some login-based code that checked, you know, logged in, which would have looked uh, on the in the controller at you know fancy Rails stuff. Um, now you can wrap it in on current user ready, and that'll make the AJAX request, which then authenticates, goes through all the Rails stack. Uh, sends back some user information, and you can then test to see if the user is authenticated. So it, it really shifts the, the way development needs to happen because you no longer can just sit in your Rails app and program your views and controllers. Um, you have to kind of coordinate this, this little dance where um, if you want to add personalization to our, our deal page, you need to First, make sure that we're shipping back the right data from the back end. Uh, then make sure that we're populating the correct objects on the front end. And then kind of hook into this whole life cycle in order to personalize the content of the page. Um, one of the other issues that we ran into was analytics. Uh, we do a lot of analytics on a whole variety of, of things that I don't really know about. Um, but uh, some of the problems are uh, like I said, we're not making requests to the, the backend server n anywhere close to as often as we were. So any tracking that's based on uh, Nginx logging or uh, anything like that isn't going to show up. It, it, it'll show up you know, a fraction of the time, only when the CDN needs to refresh its content. So uh, in our case, what we've done is added a tracking pixel that will hit Nginx, basically a, a dummy action. Uh, that just registers the fact that a user did hit the page. Um, but more complex than that is the fact that the division pages and the deal pages, uh, or the division page can show a different deal depending on your user. So it's not good enough just to know that some user hit you know, the Chicago deal page because we don't know what deal they actually hit. So in this case, we actually need to wait for the uh, Ajax personalization call, figure out you know, what user it is and what deal they're viewing, and then dynamically update the tracking pixel so that we can capture that information. Um, finally, uh, tracking parameters. We have affiliates and um, you know, search params, and we, we do analytics on all that. So again, since we're not hitting our controller, um, Initially, a lot of this functionality just broke because you know, a user comes to the page, hits a CDN, they've got their fancy parameters, and we ignore them because the page is already in the CDN, um, and then we, we update the page. So uh, what we've done here is, and this actually worked out su surprisingly well. I thought this was going to be a real pain in the ass. Instead of um, one approach would be to port all of that logic to JavaScript. Uh, in our case, what we're doing at this point is just capturing those parameters uh, on the initial landing of the user and storing that in a cookie. And then when we make the API request, we tack those on. And the way that our back end is, uh, is constructed, it will it'll basically take care of everything else. Uh, so it worked out really well. A uh, great example of, of reusing code. Um, so we just had to figure out that we needed to send those parameters at a different time. Um, 
The, uh, the last kind of issue that we ran into is uh, with A-B testing. So we do a lot of A-B testing, um, figuring out how to optimize conversions. Um, and so we actually have an in-house library called Finch uh, that has this beautiful DSL for writing uh, A-B tests. And it hopefully is going to be open source soon. Um, and you can basically stick this kind of code into a view and set up some configs. And what it will do is uh, bucket users into different variants. And depending on the variant, it'll render a different, different content. Um, so in this case, you know, two versus three step subscriptions. Uh, we have the original. Um, and in this case, it's obviously not the whole form, but you get the idea. Um, if you get this experiment, um, you'll get split into either the original, the two-step, or the three-step. Uh, and depending on which one you're in, you'll see different content. Uh, so the issue here is that it requires each request to go through to the server. At that point, it can figure out you know, what experiment are you in, which variant do you get, and then it can render it. So what would happen in CDN mode is that a specific variant uh, and a specific experiment and a specific variant would get cached into a CDN node. Um, so basically, depending on which node, which CDN node you hit, you get a different experiment, which basically defeats the entire purpose because you're no longer uh, spreading traffic out. You're, it's all clustered and weird and um, bad for everything. Uh, <laughs> so to solve this problem, uh, I implemented uh, finch.js, which, as you can imagine, is a JavaScript implementation of, of the Finch library. And it, it turned out really well. Um, because of the way that uh, JavaScript kind of just its nature, it, it fits this problem extremely well. So essentially, all you, all you do is define a, an experiment which has a you know, before, after, and the variants are just JavaScript functions. So, uh, similar to the original Finch, it will dynamically bucket users and uh, determine which variant they're in, which experiment they're in, which variant, and then execute a JavaScript function. So in this case, you know, the simplest case, it's just going to show and hide elements. Uh, often that's all that needs to happen for these, uh, uh, these A-B tests. Um, but it could be easily extended to render mustache templates um, and all sorts of cool stuff. So uh, another interesting aspect is that because of this on current user ready thing, if you're, in our case, if your experiment depends on user parameters uh, in order to you know, determine whether the experiment is valid for this user, you can actually defer the experiment execution until um, and define a function for, in this case, binding to the on current user ready event. Um, so Finch is based on Google's overlapping experiment infrastructure, um, which is a cool title for a paper. Um, it's written in CoffeeScript. We're hoping to open source it uh, soon. And it's around 15K of JavaScript, so uh, it's pretty tiny. Uh, it doesn't handle the tracking analytics or analysis side of things yet. Um, so you kind of have to have a, a little bit of background infrastructure in place in order to log uh, experiments and kind of do the, the statistical part of, of A-B testing. But it's a, it's a good start um, for the front end side of things. Um, so in the future, uh, right now the back end is returning a, a combination of uh, rendered HTML templates and JSON data. So we're reusing the, the partials that we have on the, uh, on the back end, just rendering them to strings and kind of swapping them in. Uh, what we'd like is to actually uh, leverage our own API that just spits out JSON and um, hopefully cache that in the browser with HTML5 storage and then do client-side rendering of, uh, of templates. So uh, I envision a world where you can go to Groupon and it can pull down all of the deals for uh, your division. And then you can switch deals, uh, and all the data is already there. So that's both a huge performance gain for the user, and it's a huge capacity gain for us. Because after that initial request, unless a user changes division, um, 
we have all the data and they could even browse the site offline. Um, another advantage is we can decouple from Rails. So um, we would no longer be reliant on the rendering within Rails and we could you know, implement this functionality uh, however we'd like, um, maybe with Node. Uh, shh, don't tell anyone. Um, so uh, we're also working kind of the more soft side of, of things on how to kind of integrate the front end and back end development. Um, because we're no longer kind of able to isolate things in Rails land, you kind of have to do this, this little dance, like I said, where you're updating the controller and updating the view and the JavaScript on the front end. So figuring out how to kind of best leverage that uh, functionality across uh, a large team has, has proven difficult, but um, it's, it's getting better every day. So um, better testing, like I said, testing is a little bit more difficult. And, um, kind of better monitoring of, um, actually, I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot, guys. If you have any questions, uh, we have exactly one minute, but you can feel free to find me. I'm wearing a, a tag with uh, someone else's name on it. So if you see Dan Navarra, uh, who's not here, that's me. Um, you can also find me on uh, Twitter, uh, email, and we're also hiring. So. Um, maybe head back to the Groupon beer booth, which I heard was going to get set up again, and uh, uh, talk to us. So thanks again.